Hello, my name is Tom Lorenzen, and I'm the host of the show, Interesting People. It's done under the auspices of the Chabot Los Positas Community College District in Hayward, California. The premise of the show is that there are interesting people in everybody's family, neighborhood, community. One doesn't have to be famous or well-known, of course, to be interesting. The show today uh, is also being uh, produced for, for the first time in a very interesting location. It's being done on the USS Potomac, which is based in Jack London Square in Oakland, California. The USS Potomac is the ship that was used as the presidential yacht during the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it's a unique opportunity because my guest today is Mr. John Sabrasky, who happened to join the Navy in 1934. The ship was first used in 1936 by President Roosevelt. And John joined the, the Navy in 1934, and he's had a very interesting life and got many years to go ahead, too. And one of the interesting things about John, he's very spry, his mind is very good, he has a great sense of humor, and he's now 100 years old. Welcome to Interesting People, John. Thank you. Thanks for being on the show. It's great to be here. That's great. It's great to have you here, too. I want to start off and ask a question of you about your parents. Where did, when they came to this country, where did they come to this country from? Uh, I don't remember too much about my parents because they didn't talk too much to us. Everything was in Polish. Oh. See, they didn't speak English. Yes. And being a small child, I didn't speak Polish at that time. I eventually did, but I didn't. My dad got killed in a coal mine when I was four years old, so I didn't remember him too much. They brought them uh, as immigrants over to this country to work in the coal mines. And my mother came over to this country when she was 15. I don't know how she got over here, but she came over, met my dad, and they got married at an early age. And they were both from Poland? They were both from Poland. And they met over here in the United States, right. so. they met over here. Now, your father came to the United States then strictly to work in the coal mines. Right. And he was brought over to work there. And you mentioned to me at one time when we were talking that your mother in Poland, and you used a very interesting term, that she was a slave. Can, can you elaborate what you mean by that? Uh, well, at that time, <clears throat> there were certain groups of people that would work on the farms. Uh, they, they were like owned by the owner of the farm. Mm -hmm. They lived on that farm and they worked the farm. And she was one of those persons till she got away from there when she was 15. Did she, in essence, escape then from a form of uh, indentured servitude or a form of slavery in a way in Poland? Because I don't uh, know because they wouldn't talk about it. They wouldn't, huh? When they came over here, they when you mentioned it, they'd brush it off, tell you they, they don't want to talk about it. Very interesting. So they must have had a pretty rough time over there. Did they both come through Ellis Island in New York? Yes. And did they ever talk about that experience? And uh... well, <laughs> they they used to tell some of the uh, things we went through. Some of them was kind of funny, and some of them wasn't. The, but one of the things that I remember that stuck in my mind was when a group of Italian immigrants were coming through Ellis Island. Well, the expression in those days, we used to call them WAPs, mm -hmm. but we didn't know why. <laughs> but we found out that when they came through Ellis Island, there was a group of them, and they said, all you without papers, get oh. over here. Interesting. And it was a group of Italians. Well, somebody picked up that term, and that's what they used to call them. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Semantics yeah. are interesting. Mm -hmm. I always love to learn where how words come into our, mm -hmm. our language. So that's mm -hmm. it came without papers. That and uh, they used to call them a dago too. Yeah. At that time, they resented them. They didn't like them coming over into this country. And this was. 105 years ago, 110 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So immigration's always been a a a, 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 a big issue in this country, right. hasn't it been? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Now, they came through Ellis Island in New York. Did they stay in New York for a while, do you know? I don't know. That part of a mother's life, uh, she wouldn't talk about it. No. So she must have had a pretty rough time. Now, they ended up in Pennsylvania. Did your parents meet in Pennsylvania? We lived in Pennsylvania, yeah. yes. But the, did, did they actually meet each other in Pennsylvania? Your yes. parents, they did? My mother met my father. He was working in a coal mine. Yeah. How many children did your parents have, and how many brothers and sisters did you have, John? There was seven in a family. And where did you fit in? Were you the youngest, oldest? Well, there was three girls older than me and one boy. And one so boy. I was the fifth one. Fifth one, I see. And there were seven when my dad got killed in the coal mine. Seven, wow. Yeah, mother raised seven children without welfare, without public assistance or anything. How did she do it? We lived off the land. We had three quarters of an acre, and my brother and I would dig it with a shovel and we'd plant vegetables. And we grew our own vegetables, raised chickens, and a pig once in a while. <laughs> Uh, we'd butcher the pig and have meat for a while. And then uh, at that time, you could get a uh, hunting license, and you could go into the mountains. I lived in a mountainous area, western Pennsylvania, and you could uh, hunt rabbits, uh, squirrels, pheasants, deer, and black bear. Mm -hmm. So you didn't worry about eating. You always had something to eat. You didn't have any clothes to wear, though, because huh. you wore clothes patch on patch. I see. Mm -hmm. So your dad died when you were four in an in a accident in the mines. There were seven kids. Then your mother raised seven kids by herself. Yeah. And there were no governmental resources? No government help at all at that time. And so your vegetables, did you have fruits too? or Fruits, we had, uh, we had a lot of peach trees, an apple tree, a cherry tree, and a grape arbor, and we grew berries. Right. We had three quarters of an acre, and it was all in use. I see. Mm -hmm. Now, did you raise any rabbits and chickens, or did you go elsewhere no, to No, we obtain? raised them. We raised them, so then no. you would use them for when food a as chicken, well. The saying was, when a chicken quit laying, it went in the pot. <laughs> That's a reason not to quit laying eggs then. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Be careful on that. So, you, your, your mother and your family, this was real poverty, in a way, by today's standards. It was. Did you know you were poor? Oh, yeah. We knew I was poor. My mother, after my dad died, after he got killed in the mine, my mother would get, go out and look for work as a housekeeper. That was the only kind of work a woman did in those days. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she'd come back home with an old shirt or an old pair of pants that I would wear to school. Oh. So she would like outfit me sometimes. They would give out old pieces of clothing and should bring them home. What was, so seven kids and your mother after your dad was killed, what was the structure you lived in? I mean, with the house, what, what, what was it like with the seven kids and your mother? How did you live there? Very disciplined. Very disciplined. The girls made everything, made you behave. You, there was no <laughs> fooling around. You, everybody had a chore to do because you had three quarters of an acre of land. Uh -huh. You had chickens. And once in a while, rabbits. Once in a while, you'd get a pig, and somebody would have an extra pig, it'd give you a little one, and you would raise it until you butchered them. Huh. Now, was it, what, the size of the house, with that not many people, what was it the size? I mean, was there two bedrooms, three uh, bedrooms? Three bedrooms. Three there bedrooms. two-story house, three two bedrooms. Oh. Yeah. What was the name of the town in Pennsylvania? Do you remember? <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> Fair chance. Fair chance. Oh, wow. Never forget that name because uh, it was like the outskirts of uh, Uniontown, six miles out of Uniontown. It was all at the foot of the mountains, and we were like living in the country. You had no name. We would say Uniontown. 
RFDs, what the addresses were. Ah. So they came in one time to build a factory there to make glass, window glass. Mm -hmm. And everybody was pushing around the gate of the factory there, you know. And the man came out and he said, now I want you to knock off this shoving and people pushing around because I am going to give everybody a fair chance. <laughs> so they named it Fair Chance. What a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. so that's what the na how the town got its name, mm -hmm. a fair chance. And that was before the New Deal, the Fair Deal. Oh, yeah. So yeah. individuals here create a town to try and mm -hmm. give a fair chance. That's mm -hmm. a very, very wonderful story, John. Uh, tell, tell us about the house. It's hard for us to imagine today what it was like living in a house like that. Tell us about plumbing. Electricity? We Any? had no indoor plumbing. No indoor plumbing? No. We had a well, and we kept no refrigerators. Uh, the milk, butter, and eggs went in a bucket down the well. So you didn't have an ice box even? No. Wow. And uh, you put them in down there at the water's level, and the temperature is the same as the refrigerator. So you would lower it down on a rope? Lower it down on a rope. and. In the bucket. In a bucket? Get down to the water's edge and let it sit there. Huh. Wow. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm old enough where I can remember when, when I was a little kid, we had an ice box up until about the age of six before we got a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. But I never knew anybody <coughs> that was free ice box and had to live without a, even an ice box. That's yeah, see, there was no indoor plumbing. You had uh, outhouses. You didn't have toilets yeah. in the house. Was that common to use a well to yes. for food to keep it cool? Yeah. It was. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was your drinking water, too, because there was no city water at that time. I see. Mm -hmm. Now, how, did you, how was the house kept? What, how, what did you do for lights inside the house? We had, at that time, we had uh, gas jets that would come out of the wall in each room. Mm -hmm with a mantle on it, and you'd light the mantle. Was that considered dangerous? Well, it was dangerous, but that's the only thing you had for lights, and that's what you used for your, eventually, for cooking. You used the usually cold stove, but they would then get to the gas, and so they'd get a gas burner and use that. When did you first ha have any electricity? <laughs> Gee, I mean... Must have been around 1932, 34, because I remember electricity came out and my mother said, I want electric in the house. Mm -hmm. So you do it. And I said, I'm no electrician. I don't know anything about electricity. And she said, well, get a book and find out. <laughs> so I wired the house for electricity. So you learned it all on your own. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. Clothing, you said your mother would bring home clothes. Hand-me-downs. Hand-me-downs, so that's all your family had was hand-me-downs. Yeah, we were wore hand-me-downs all through high school. All through mm -hmm. high school, wow. Never had an, a new piece of clothing as a child? No, not that I remember. Yeah. These were hand-me-downs that came from other families then? Other families. Your... My mother would go and do housework. Uh-huh. If somebody was giving away a pair of pants, she'd say, I'll take them. Uh-huh. She'd bring them home. I see. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. That puts a lot of things in perspective in our current age mm -hmm. when we think of how people oh, yeah. lived uh, at that time <clears throat> and how difficult things were. Well, at this point, John, we're going to take a short pause for a public service announcement, and then we're going to come back uh, to the interview in, in, right after that. Mm -hmm. Okay? I make learning a privilege, not a chore, and unconventional methods common. I'm a teacher. I make more. Welcome back to Interesting People. My name is Tom Lorenzen, the host of the show, and my guest today is Mr. John Sabraski, who is a 100-year-old veteran uh, from the Navy, having joined in 1934. And as referenced earlier in the show, we're on the USS Potomac here at Jack London Square in Oakland, California. And uh, we're, we just changed locations here a little bit, so we're in another part. This, we're in the main dining room here on the Potomac, 
And this is where FDR would eat his meals and could entertain guests. It's the main room uh, here on the ship. And I'd like to always let people know is this ship is available for tours at any time here at Chaclone Square in Oakland, California. Now back to my guest, back to you, John. We're talking about growing up in <coughs> Pennsylvania. You grew up in real poverty. Your dad died young. You were only four years old in a mining accident. Your mother raised, was raising seven kids. What was it like when you went to school? You're living in, in a very poor circumstances at, in a small town called Fairchance, Pennsylvania. Yeah. What was school like <clears throat> at that time? It was very difficult. I had to go with my brother. The two of us had to stay together, or if I was by myself, the other boys would beat me up. Really? See, uh, our parents were foreign born. Mm -hmm. So they called us hunkies. Hunkies. So they would beat us up. You don't belong here. Go back where you came from. Interesting. That's what went on when I was going to school. I have a scar on my arm where they cut me one time. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, some things really haven't changed, yep. have they? Mm -hmm. So as, a, as an immigrant family, <clears throat> you were treated in a very difficult manner and, yep. and painful manner. Yeah, I graduated in 1932. Her mother made me go to school. She said, you're going to school. Now you, in, uh, in high school, when we were talking earlier about uh, your house too, and I like to capture things, a period of time and the conditions for our audience to understand some things. So this period of time in your home you had gas, you didn't have electricity, you finally ended up having to learn and install mm -hmm. electricity yourself. What was taking place at that time? Was there any radio? Did you uh, have a Radio was just coming out, but uh, you had to string an aerial outside of your house and come and hook it up to whatever that contained box, I called it, was uh -huh. in the house for you to be able to pick up sound. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So for those of us who have grown up totally in a television environment, an internet environment now, you actually lived during a period of time when you didn't even have hardly any access even to radio. That's right, yeah. A whole different yeah. period of time. Very interesting. When you were in high school, you said you, you told me you'd played football. Yes. And uh, what position did you play? I was a halfback until I hurt this leg, which now is starting to bother me. And then I went on a line and I played a guard. Did you? Mm -hmm. Now, in that period of time, what type of, now football players have all these sophisticated helmets and pads and everything, what type of protection did you have at that time? The football helmet in my day, you could fold it up and put it in your hip pocket. Really? Like a cap? Like a cap. Mm -hmm. That was it? Yeah. Wow. Was there an awareness of how actually dangerous that sport could be? Evidently, nobody brought it up or said anything about it. So you went, we had, uh, we had 13 men on our football team. Mm -hmm. So you played offense and defense. Offense. We had two spares. Huh. And this was tackle football. Yeah. Oh boy. When you reference <clears throat> about being an immigrant family and uh, difficult, painful experiences you had as an immigrant family too, uh, when we had talked before, you referenced about a presence of the uh, KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, in, yeah. in western Pennsylvania. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, that was an organization of local people that you didn't know, but they would dress in white robes and white hoods, and they would plant a burning cross on the Catholics' lawns. Mm -hmm. Tell you to get out of here, you don't belong here. And they would march the streets, you know, in front of your house. Because in this day and age, when the KKK is brought up, it's always more often not identified with uh, against African Americans and blacks. Mm -hmm. Your, uh, but in your area, it was largely anti-Catholic. It was anti-Catholic. Yeah. Was it anti-Jewish too? Probably was. Yeah. Um, we, I don't remember any Jewish people living there. Uh huh. Yeah. This period of time, you're born in 1915. Uh, Europe was really the 
dominant place in the world. The Great War, which we now call World War I, happened when you were a child. Uh, the United States entered the war in 1918, uh, 1917 actually, and mm -hmm. was in it for the last year and a half or so of the war. At the end of the war, the Russian Revolution happens. Mussolini comes into power in Italy in 1922, Depression in 29, and Hitler in 33. How did you view the world? How did people view the world at that time in this country with all these things going on, the depression in this country, the depression abroad, the rise of these tyrants? Were, there, were people talking about this? Were there concerns? Well, your parents would always say that there's going to be a war. They would. Yes. With all this going on, they'd always say that it's going to be a war. And that's why <clears throat> The young men at that time, if I didn't know if I had, all I needed was somebody to tell me to go play football. I could have went to the University of Pittsburgh, University of Carnegie Tech, but nobody told me, all you have to do is go play. Don't worry about the money, somebody else will take care of it. Yeah. I said, I ain't got any money, so I didn't go. Oh, interesting. So I went into service. Now, were you a pretty good football player then, do you think? I was a pretty good football pretty player, good. <laughs> you know. Mm. And, uh, anyway, how did, so it's 1934, the Depression's taking place, you're living in a poor environment uh, anyway, <coughs> before the Depression. How did the idea come up about joining the Navy? And we have some background sound coming to right now because we're right near the railroad tracks here in Oakland, so if you hear background noise, it's because of the train going by here and it should be just past us in a, in a couple of seconds here. That's part of the color of our of the neighborhood down there, no. John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's the passenger train going by. But go, go back then, how did the idea of even going in the Navy come up? Uh, the idea came up, uh, I had three brothers, there were four boys, so the idea came up that we could send 10, uh, pay was $21 a month. $21 a month. And uh, we could send $10 back home. Wow. So that's why I joined the Navy. They turned my brother down in the Navy because he didn't have an opposing bite. So he went in the Marines <laughs> and the other one went in the Army. And the fourth one, he wound up uh, a few years later as an engineer on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad because he used to tell me when I'd go home, I did pretty good for a dropout, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, you joined in 19, was, was, was it hard to join the Navy? Did they let most anybody in? No, or? you had, uh, they give you a complete physical examination. And if you didn't pass, they didn't take, like the Navy didn't take my brother because he didn't have an opposing bite. Mm -hmm. I don't know, because I remember him telling them, I'm not going to bite them, I'm going to shoot them. <laughs> but uh, the Marines took him. Uh -huh. So he went in the Marines. I see. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. When you joined the Navy then, where did they first send you when you joined for basic training, I guess? Uh, San Diego, California. They sent you to San Diego. Naval Training Center in San Diego. Is that when you first learned about the promised land of California? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's where I learned, uh, and you know, it's funny because years later I wound up as a paymaster on a base there. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think when you saw coming out of a, a rural area and poor background to see San Diego at that time? And San Diego at that time I know is not the developed San no, Diego is yeah. now. It was really a, a seaport. And yeah. What did you think when you saw the ocean in uh, San Diego at that time? Well, it was new. Everything was new to me, so I had to take it one step at a time, you know, as I'm moving along. Everything was new. What was your uh, assignment then after you got out of basic training, et cetera? What type of job did you have in the Navy? I, uh, I was on a, my first ship was a minesweeper. Minesweeper. Okay. But they didn't have mines at that time to sweep, so we would <laughs> pick up channel boys and repaint them and reset them. Oh. But I wanted to get off of that one, so I went in, uh, took the examination for what the Navy calls a storekeeper. Storekeeper, okay. A storekeeper buys supplies for the ships, 
Also, you're a paymaster if you're an officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wound up as a, in a supply department. And what, ty what type of title did they give you then? Did they promote you with that responsibility then? And yeah, I went out, I wound up as a chief warrant officer. Chief warrant officer. Mm -hmm. Did you have to go through training then in terms of contracting and things like that? Uh, as an enlisted man, I did. I went through boot camp in Norfolk, Virginia. I, okay. And that's where they picked you out. You either made it or you went back home. With a warrant, what was you? Did you have a limit for how much you could do under that warrant, like a five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars? Oh no, I used to go to the bank in San Diego and pick up a couple million dollars for the payroll. Holy cow! Yeah. Did you have a bodyguards with you? Five marines. Five marines. Mm -hmm. Did you pay in cash then? Yeah, everything was paid in cash then. That's incredible. No checks. Everything was cash. Hardly anybody pays in cash anymore. That's right, yeah. The whole mm -hmm. world has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, after with San Diego and Norfolk, where did you go from there when you were in the Navy? And this is in the, the mid-30s then, I guess. Uh, I Maybe. went to submarine school in uh, New London, Connecticut. New London, Connecticut? That's where the submarine uh, school is. What were submarines like in the 1930s? They must have been pretty primitive. Very small. Very small. Yeah, and uh, before you could get on it, they, at the submarine base, they have a tank, a big tank, 100 feet up in the air full of water. And down on the bottom, they have a door where you could get in and sit in water up to here, you know, to keep the other one closed. And then they give you the Monson lung, put it on and try to duck your head in the water, and then they open the door and they shove you in there. You got to go up 100 feet. Wow. See, but they have a rope there. Every 10 feet, you grab a hold of the knot and you hold on and count to 10. Then you go up to the next one so you don't get the bends, you know, when you go wow. up all the way. Then if you make it through there, then you could go to the submarine. Were you a good swimmer too then, John? Oh, yeah, yeah. Where'd you learn to swim in, in Pennsylvania? Or? Pennsylvania. What, in a, in a river or? In a river, yeah. They threw you in, you learned to swim. So you didn't have any fear of water then? No. Uh, what about submarines? Because that's a very difficult uh, uh, ship to serve on. There's a lot of fear because of the being well, enclosed there. You, d you didn't uh, exactly fear it there. I mean, maybe, maybe some of them did. You just took it as a place where you were working. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that uh, stuck in your mind more than anything else, if you had to escape, they'd shoot you out of the torpedo tube. Out of a torpedo yeah. tube? That was, well, that's the only way to get out. You can't open the top part, you'll sink the ship. When they shoot you out, was there something that propelled you then? Yeah. Was it air? Hi, may I please have an application? Thank you. Skip the drama. Get your diploma. Okay. Take that first step towards a better future. Find free adult education classes at finishyourdiploma.org. Welcome back to Interesting People. My name's Tom Lorenz, I'm the host of the show, and my guest today is Mr. John Sabraski, who joined the U.S. Navy in 1934 and recently celebrated his 100th anniversary. And we're doing uh, this interview on the USS Potomac at Jacqueline Square here in Oakland. And uh, we're gonna go back to the, our discussion here, John. Now you, at a certain point then, you were, you'd gone through submarine school and training, and then you were sent to Panama, is that correct? Yes. About what year was that, do you know? That was just before the war, just the before. late 30s, 39, 40, in that time, air time zone. And how long were you in Panama? Four years. Four years? Mm -hmm. And what were, you, what were you doing there in Panama for the Navy then? Well, I had kind of a, I'd say a funny system working for me. <laughs> they would send me to a place, like they send me to the submarine base at New London, Connecticut. I was, at that time, a rated storekeeper. 
okay. which didn't belong on the submarines. Yes, okay. So they said, what are you doing here? I said, I go where they send me. Well, as long as you're here, you might as well go through it. <laughs> so they put it through even though I couldn't go on a submarine. Uh -huh. So when I got through, what are you going to do with it? Well, we can't put him on a submarine and send him down on a submarine base down there. Uh -huh. So there was a submarine base in Panama. On the Atlantic side, yes. On the Atlantic side, and just right by the Panama Canal? Right. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So submarines at that time, though, did we? We didn't have many submarines, did No, we? they were the R-boats. I trained on the R-boats, and the boats that were in the were the S-boats. Now, were you in Panama? When uh, you first, where were you when you first learned of Pearl Harbor? Is that where you were in Panama, or were you somewhere else? I was in Panama. And did that come? I know it was a surprise at attack, but you said earlier that there was a, I think, a smell that war was coming. Wait a minute, there. I wasn't in Panama. I think I must have been on the aircraft carrier. Right, were you assigned to the carrier then at the time of Pearl Harbor? Do you think? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And was that the Essex? The Essex. So you were on a carrier when you learned of Pearl Harbor. Right. And were you then at, 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 on the ocean, or were you in the in a? No, in we were in the states. Okay. But uh, if my memory serves me right, I was either in Boston or Philadelphia. Okay. Navy Yards there. But then once the war broke out, you were on the Essex for the full Tell duration of the war. For the duration of the war, of the war yeah. And you were in the Pacific the whole time? Yes. What was it like working and living on an aircraft carrier for the full duration of the war? What was... Well, it's uh, like everything else. You set your mind to what you're going to do and you do it. I mean, we happened to get hit at another time. Like I always tell people, if I was about that much slower, I wouldn't be here. Because the kamikaze came over my battery. Whereas I, I was a battery officer of these 10 guns, 10, 20 millimeters. And he came over the battery, and we couldn't explode him. So he came over and hit the deck. On the 25th of November, 1944, a lone Japanese bomber closes in on the USS Essex. Its pilot is part of a new force the Special Attack Corps, Kamikaze. How many uh, people were killed that, from that? You know? uh, when we had the planes up there, had the planes all ready, a bunch of them out there all getting ready to take off 115. Were killed because of the Kamikaze attack? No. Wow. Were you, were, was there fear the ship would sink? No. No? Because it shared off part of the flight deck. I see. see? And uh, the other, the, uh, what do you call it, the launcher was on the other side. It was on the port side, so on the starboard side. So you could still launch an airplane. Mm -hmm. And you could land them, yeah, too. About how many planes were on the Essex, do you know? About 80. About 80. Mm -hmm. and we had fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo planes. Three squadrons. Three squadrons. Well, tell us then, after Pearl Harbor, then you're on the Essex for the full duration of the war, what uh, particular actions stand out in your mind, what particular battles and, uh, and fights in the Pacific? Any locations or any particular well, locations? Well, the ones that six in my mind more than anything else was Okinawa. The United okay. States Navy probed the waters of the East China Sea, launching strike after strike against the Ryukyus. Okinawa was the principal target for cameras as well as bombs. As we went through hell between Okinawa and Japan, we had to knock down everything that was flying out of Japan. Wow. So they were coming after you. Because mm -hmm. they knew that if they got you, they downed 80 planes. Yeah, wow. The Battle of Okinawa, as I have read anyway, and I was on Okinawa once, was a pretty but bloody uh, mm -hmm. battle to regain that island, right? Yeah. To regain the island. So your planes were being used both to attack the enemy on Okinawa plus to stop the enemy aircraft from attacking at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
See, we had the three divisions. We had a torpedo plane, we had a uh, dive bomber, and we had the fighter plane. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think you had mentioned to me at one time that you, on the Essex you were uh, assigned at Iwo Jima, too. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, we were, at the, we were between there. We, between Japan and those islands up there, we're running around all through there. Were you were you there in the vicinity when the battle for Iwo Jima took place? Then yeah, yeah. What what do you recall on on that? What was that like to be in that type of heavy? Well, it's strange to say, but I didn't set my mind on what was going on there. I was just going through like I'm going through a regular day's work. Really to keep my mind off of that other stuff that's going on. I see. Unless it was directly affected me, I'm keeping away from it as far as I can. Mm -hmm. During the war, yourself, other people on the Essex, was there concern that we might not win the war? No. We, we never thought it looked at it that way. Never did. We always figured we was going to win. And why was that? I don't know. I mean, uh, American, just like playing football, you're going to win. You're going out there, you're going to win. Even though you lose, you still <laughs> thought you were going to win. Uh -huh. So there was a lot of confidence. Oh, there was confidence, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And this is among all the ranks in the, the Navy through your experience? Yes, there was the, uh, the fighter pilots, you'd watch them when they're going out there to get into their planes, take off, watch them when they're coming back. You could see the Vigor in them, you know, they're oh, really, really after it, you know, going after it. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what's your recollection of the leadership in the Navy at that time, uh, individuals like Chester Nimitz, Paul Halsey? What's your, do you, was there, what were the viewpoints at that time about the leadership? Uh, well, most of the people well, I wouldn't say, I won't speak for the other people. I don't know what they're thinking, but I went along with Nimitz. Uh -huh. I didn't care too much for Bo Halsey. And the reason that I didn't think too much, he would take a lot of chances without first investigating what it was going to cost or how many people were going to kill. He'd like to just go right in, you know. Mm -hmm. and I didn't like that. That's why he had the nickname Bull Halsey then. That's huh? why he called him Bull. <laughs> and uh, Admiral Nimitz, though, he was in charge of the entire Pacific Fleet, yes, right? Yes, he was. Did you ever have a chance to see him or meet him or anything? Well, he was on the ship. I never had a chance to talk to him because, you know, he enlisted. I was uh, enlisted at that time. Mm -hmm. You didn't go talk to the officers. Uh-huh. I see. Unless you were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and he, did you ever get in trouble, John? No, I was pretty lucky. I, a good boy. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, 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 now, we, were you, you had a battery unit too then, and you were also uh, I was supplied? a battery officer of a, uh, 10 20 millimeter guns. So I had 10 guys, men, and these 10, 10 guns. guys, I was a battery officer. Wow. Five inch gun, it was right along the after part of the flight deck, and the five inch guns would shoot over our head. Oh, wow. First one went all blew the cotton out of your ears, and that was it. I assume a number of guys went deaf during that period of time. Oh, yeah, yeah. As the war is going on, then, were you fully, you're out on the ocean, on the Essex, were you pretty much aware of what was going on in Europe as well, and, uh, and with the battle in the Atlantic, uh, fight, the fighting that was going on over there? No, we didn't. Too much about that there. We didn't more or less concentrating on what we were doing there. I see. Unless uh, it would come up like you'd hear on and somebody would tell you about it or they heard it on the news or somebody got a letter from home told them what was going on. Mm -hmm. As, uh, do you remember when you heard of the war ending in Europe? Uh, do you recall, were you on the Essex at that time when the yep. war ended? And was there an assumption the war was going to end soon then in the Pacific too, or what were the thoughts at that time, do you recall? They figured it would be over, yeah. You know. And you were, were you preparing to the, for an invasion of Japan? Yeah. We were ready. We were all set for the invasion. And when that war ended over there, 
Then they held back, and then the Japanese finally surrendered. Hmm. The, uh, in preparing for D-Day, I know that was considered the largest armada, I think, in, in history. <laughs> that took place at Normandy to on D-Day. Now, from what I've read, I guess the pre preparation for the invasion of Japan was even larger than for D-Day. Oh, yeah. They had a monstrous fleet out there, ships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was no awareness <clears throat> of what was going on in terms of the development of the atomic bomb. That was top secret. Uh, that, that was top secret at that time. Uh, we knew that there was something like that, but we didn't know anything about it. What do you recall your thoughts and of your shipmates when you first heard of the atomic bomb? Because that was something new and devastating and powerful. And what Well, were it wasn't new to me because I was there when they detonated the first one. Results of the atom bombs in New Mexico and Japan are known. What will happen at Bikini? Bikini at all. At the Bikini. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well. So when the if, when the atomic bomb was dropped the first time, then the second time on Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Were, was there surprised that the Japanese actually did surrender, or...? I think that's what made them surrender. What made because, them surrender? I mean, that was something. Was that there was nothing there. I just blew everything out of the ocean. Uh -huh. I mean, the island wasn't even there that they put the bomb on. Yeah. So was there a lot of relief then? Because uh, when this, the war obviously came to an end then, when the Japanese yeah. surrendered? Battleship Missouri, 53,000 ton flagship of Admiral Halsey's Third Fleet, becomes the scene of an unforgettable ceremony marking the complete and formal surrender of Japan. In the Bay of Tokyo itself, the United States destroyer Buchanan comes alongside, bringing representatives of the Allied powers to witness the final capitulation. General of the Army Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Allied Commander for the occupation of Japan, boards the Missouri. Fleet Admiral Nimitz, Pacific Fleet Commander, and Admiral Halsey welcome MacArthur and his Chief of Staff, General Sutherland, aboard. Yeah. And it, was everybody enthused about heading home then? Well, you know, it's funny on how an individual acts, but one guy we shot down didn't kill him. And they picked him up, and they brought him aboard the carrier down in a down below deck, and the guys would be taking him candy bars. Oh. See? He was like he was our buddy. Really? Interesting. That's, that's the outlook. That's the way they felt. Uh -huh. It wasn't our enemy, actually. It was just we're out there doing a job. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. But we'd feed him, take candy bars to him. He probably wondered what the hell's the matter with them people, but he ate the candy. <laughs> Being we're on the USS Potomac, do you recall when you heard that uh, President Roosevelt had died? Do you remember hearing that when you were out in the, out in the Pacific? No, I don't remember that. You don't remember it, okay. You know what we're going to do as we're uh, approaching here, we're going to uh, pause a little bit uh, to take a, a break for another public service announcement. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to come back and, and, and ask you a question about a wonderful lady you met at some point that uh, became your wife. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do that when we come back and then talk to you about what happened with the rest of your life after the war ended and, uh, and your life experiences then. So we will be coming back after this break for a public service announcement. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be.
said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. Welcome back to Interesting People. My name is Tom Lorenzen, the host of the show, and with my guest today, John Sabrowski. John's a hundred year old gentleman who is a Navy veteran, uh, enlisted in the Navy in 1934. We've been talking about his World War II experiences, and we're going to come back to that uh, uh, for a minute here, John. Now, one thing that I had didn't ask you was at some point you met a lady. And I think her name was Mary. How did, where did that happen? And um... I was stationed in uh, Panama in a submarine base down there. And I came up on leave. And uh, I was running around with a guy, a friend of mine. He wasn't in the service. He was still back home. But I didn't know it at the time, but he was her cousin. And he had taken and shown me the town to we went all around and then he said the last day I was there he said well I have no place to go now Lee. let's go down to see my cousin her mother always has something to eat so we went there and I met Mary mm -hmm. and then I went back to Panama and I was down in Panama but I have correspond with her I see and then the next time I come up from Panama we got married so we were married 76 years. 76 years. Now, now, you share with me at one point a story, though. You left her standing on the pier before you got married. Right. Tell, tell us about that. Uh, I went back uh, to Ohio to pick her up. My ship was in San Francisco. So I brought her down to shore of the ship. Now, we didn't have a place to stay or anything at that time, you know, because I'd gone there and picked her up, brought her here. Took her down to the docks and they got a hold of me, get aboard, we're leaving. And I left and left her standing on a dock. So the, my buddy said, what is, what's she going to do? I said, if she don't leave me now, she'll never leave me. And, uh, but there was a lady that happened to be there and she saw the, what the situation was and she said, come with me. You stay with me until you can find an apartment. Mm -hmm. And she found her an apartment, and she stayed there till I came back. I was gone for over a year. Over a year. And what did Mary do during that period of time? She worked volunteer work for the American Red Cross. Oh, in San yeah, Francisco? San Francisco. Oh. After the uh, war then, you stayed in the Navy uh, for another 10 years, I guess. Then. Oh, yeah, I, I retired from the Navy. And 19, 20 years. 1955. 50, 1955. Yeah. So you actually had t about 21 years, actually, yeah. in the Navy. You retired from the Navy, and then you were living here in the San Francisco Bay Area? I was living in San Francisco until I came back from the Navy. Then I moved out of the city and bought a house in Castro Valley in 1946. Mm hmm. I say 46. Yeah. I'm still in that same house. <laughs> well, that's the year I was born, John. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm in Castor Valley, too, with you. So it's wonderful to be in the same town with you. And, and that's I, how we met, too. Yeah. And I worked for Coca-Cola for 20 years. I retired from Coca-Cola also. Now, how did you end up going to work for Coca-Cola? I don't know how that happened. What did you do with Coca-Cola? I was the office manager. The office manager. Yeah, I run that place on Maddox Road. And was it, was it, did you do the bottling there? Oh, yeah, there for a while. And then uh, the latter years, they moved the bottling to San Leandro. OK. And that was just a warehouse that the trucks operated out of there. I see. So how many employees worked there when you were the, the manager? Oh, gee, I had three, four, four girls in the office. 
And I guess they must have had 15 routes going out of there, 15 or 20 routes going out of there. You told me a story one time about your mother, because uh, she had no education. She raised the kids. You lived off of the food. You were basically raised on your own three quarters of an acre. And when she died, she somehow saved money and gave to the kids. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, <clears throat> mother was, uh, she had no education. She was illiterate. Uh -huh. Because she worked on a farm in Europe as a slave. Uh -huh. She got away some way when she was 15 and wound up in the United States. So she had no education. So the only kind of work she would do would be housework. And that's when she would bring hand-me-down clothes back for uh -huh. us. But she raised seven of them. And then, but she also saved money, apparently. She, and then when she when passed she away... When she died... We were surprised. She left a thousand dollars for all seven of us. She must have been quite a lady. Yeah. So all all of the kids, all seven kids, all got a thousand dollars. Seven of us. That was that was mm -hmm. quite a uh, good sum of money at that it time. It was yeah. for her to save money all those years and then mm -hmm. leave it to you. And we lived off the land there. We had three quarters of an acre. My brother and I would dig it with a shovel. We had, didn't have $3 to have a horse come in and plow it. Mm -hmm. So we'd dig it, plant vegetables, yeah. grow enough to where you put it away for the winter to take you through the winter. Uh -huh. But John, now that you're a uh, vibrant 100 years old, too, what, what uh, lessons do you think you've learned? What have been the things that you've learned most in your life that have been most important to that you learn and you think it's worth sharing with other people? Well, I've always believed if something's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, there ain't a damn thing you could do to stop it. So let it, let it go, but do the best you can. Be nice to everybody, treat everybody with respect, and you'll get along fine. Get along with the people. Mm -hmm. Don't be an agitator, don't be a troublemaker, start trouble. Listen to what the other guy has to say. Mm -hmm. If it's good, keep it. If it isn't good, just toss it aside. And I've always tried to treat everybody with respect. What do you think at age 100, and you're, you're a healthy man at 100, what's, has there been anything that's been key, do you think, <clears throat> to your, your health and your longevity? Uh, what I ate what while I ate? was growing up. I eat a lot of greens. A lot of greens. Yeah. Salads. Lived off the land, so we ate off the land. Mm -hmm. Chickens, rabbits. If somebody went hunting, you got a deer, they'd give you a chunk of deer meat or bear meat, whatever, you know, so you always had that coming in. Now, throughout your, when you were growing up in Pennsylvania and throughout your period of time in Pennsylvania, too, the, you, you grew your vegetables, you had some fruits on your land, you had got rabbits and chickens. Did you ever go to a grocery store during that period of time? No. no. <laughs> Never went to a store. I don't think any of us would know how to do anything if we didn't have no. access to the grocery store. No, we never went to the store. I, well, I'll take that back. I remember one time, mother told me, here's, I don't, I don't know what she gave me. See, it was in silver. Here, the, take this and go to the butcher and tell him you want a pound of whatever it was. I said, well, what are, just go. He'll know what you want, what I want. And I went and got whatever it was and brought it back home. That's the only time I ever went to a store. Uh -huh. mm. Now, in your 100 years that you've been with us and hope many more years to come, two, you had no electricity when you grew up. You, you put it in later. Uh, you were able to put in there no TV. You had no radio. You finally had to get access there. You, you did you have? There was, were there any automobiles at that time in your town? Uh, or no. Was horse? Was it horse and buggy? Uh, there was an automobile at that time, but only the rich people had it. I see. The ordinary person didn't have an automobile. It cost six hundred dollars. Six hundred dollars. That was a lot. Yeah, in those days, that was a lot of money. So did you have to walk and t would go walk. horse? Every place you went, you walked. Were bicycles used at all? Bicycles finally came in later. Uh -huh. 
But you walked, we used to walk, I walked to work six miles each way. Holy cow. Worked in a mill, making uh, laundry trays and bathtubs. Mm -hmm. I was 13, told him I was 16. At that time, you didn't have to produce a birth certificate, so big for my age, I went to work. So it was child labor, but you volunteered for child oh, labor because right. you needed to make some money. Mm. Now, as we're in the modern era, where we walk around with te television has been so much a part of our lives for 65 years now, virtually. Uh, telephones, we got iPhones, iPads, laptops, we got all this <coughs> technology. You grew up in a period of time when none of us, none of this was there. Yeah, I'm glad I did. Really? And why is that? When I retired, I was an accountant all my life. I was an accountant for Coca-Cola for 20 yeah, years. Okay. Uh -huh. First thing I did when I retired, I got rid of my computer and my calculator. <laughs> Told my son, I said, get him out of here. Uh -huh. I don't have him. What do you think uh, the impact is for most of us now, because we're all hooked in to all the technology is What's the good and bad of that from your perspective at age 100? I don't know. I, well, it's what you're going to do with it. What you're going to do with it, okay. Yeah. Because there are a lot of people who will take advantage of it for a, not a good purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a good life. You could live a good life at this time and age right now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work out there. You could get a job if you want a job. You get an education if you want to go to school. See, when I was growing up, I couldn't go to school. I went to high school. But all I needed was somebody to tell me, you go to the University of Pittsburgh as a football player. Yeah. Don't worry about the money. There was nobody to tell me that. Okay. So I didn't go. Yeah. I could have went there and played football. Sure. The America that you grew up in as an immigrant family and you had difficult experiences, but you, you had a brother that protected you and got through all that came out of poverty. The America that exists now is quite different. What do you, what do you think of this country, past, present, and future? I like the old days. The modern time now is there are too many people that are taking everything for granted. You don't have a guy that will take, like I remember mother saying, I want electricity. I don't know electricity. Get a book and find out. Wire the house for electricity, which I did. You don't, I don't think you'll find that too much nowadays. Mm -hmm. So the modern generation just takes what they could get as they get it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's putting forth any anything or volunteer work or to think up something new. Nothing like that anymore. So sort of from a broad picture, as this as America became after the two world wars became the major power in the world, and with the end of the Cold War, certainly the major power. And now uh, we have rise of other powers, China and, uh, in particular. Do you feel confident in our country, uh, where we're at and where we're going, or are you concerned about our country? Uh, uh, sometimes uh, I'm a little concerned. I like the younger generation to get an education. Education is important. I'd like for them to go to school. And the ones who want to volunteer for the military, to volunteer for the military so we could have a strong force. Mm -hmm. and look on the peaceful side of life instead of the other side. I see. Well, John, as we uh, wrap up this interview, uh, I want to say something I think can speak on behalf of a lot of people or the people that will view this on TV and YouTube also as well. But I'd like to say something. You know, thank you for your military service. You entered in 1934. You left in 1955. You saw a combat in the Pacific. And uh, you're part of that generation that we all look up to now. And we deeply appreciate the type of things that you did for this country and for the world. And uh, it gives me a lot of pride to be able to sit here and spend some time with somebody who's very interesting and to me a very important person. So I'd like to take the liberty and thank you for everything you've done for our country.
Well, you're welcome. Okay. I'm glad that I could do it. And I think I can speak on behalf of us. We end this interview on the USS Potomac that Franklin Roosevelt and presidents would look at something like this and say, you're a great American. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much.